participants in class activities. We celebrate diversity and recognize the differences in student context. We ensure that every student is an essential part of the conversation. The FEU Institute of Education has developed this unique teaching and learning culture in which students are seen as co-creators of knowledge and teachers as facilitators of learning. This kind of setup develops an excellent, one-of-a-kind learning experience for the students. Our faculty are experts in the field of education and research. They are all updated in the latest trends in teacher education. The Institute of Education recognizes that we are part of a larger community. We ensure that students are not just limited to the classroom, but are engaged in their community. IE makes sure students have the best college life experience possible with its student-based organizations such as the Institute of Education Student Council and the Young Educator Society. Students are able to experience programs and activities that do not only cater to their academic needs, but also hone their leadership skills through extracurricular activities. The student organizations help the Institute to reach out to communities in need. FEUIE advocates for our teachers' welfare, values the importance of research, and contributes to our partner institutions to ensure that the transformative power of education reaches everyone. This is the Institute of Education, where students, faculty, and staff work hand-in-hand -hand to build a future-ready community. The Institute of Education Department of Graduate Studies and Transnational Education is an innovative institution that promises career advancement through research and development. It is recognized by the Commission on Higher Education as a center of excellence in teacher education. It has a level three certification from the Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities and is recognized as CPD provider by the Professional Regulation Commission. The Department of Graduate Studies features the most upbeat programs in the country, featuring MA and PhD programs that are designed with core courses and specialization options. We firmly believe that research is a commitment to quality education, and so we have different programs which aim to foster the culture of research in our students and faculty. Our off-classroom activities act as extensions of our faculty expertise and student training. Gold is a graduate online academic lecture series which features graduate faculty who share specialized topics in research, education, and online instruction. RTD and VCAP are both workshops which aim to monitor student progress in their theses and dissertation as well as train research advisors in mentorship. To ensure that students' work is publication ready, we host the right shop in collaboration with the Asian Journal on Perspectives in Education where participants engage in mentoring sessions with the journal editors. For aspiring professionals who are interested to enter the teaching profession, the IE Graduate Studies offers the Teacher Certificate Program. It is an 18-unit program that provides learners with adequate academic and practical knowledge, exposure to classroom practices, and relevant research-based methodologies to develop our learners' teaching abilities. The program has been implementing the e-learning approach since 2008. Our faculty have relevant graduate degrees and industry experience and engage students beyond the classroom. They are research focused and engage in facilitating teacher training in both basic and higher education. They value student input and model their classes based on the latest trends in teacher education. This is the Institute of Education where student faculty, and staff to work hand-in-hand -hand to build a future-ready community. Welcome to Far Eastern University. Here are some reminders from the FEU Office of Education Technology. Join 15 minutes before the start of the event. Make sure to dress appropriately. Remember that this is a formal engagement in an online setting. Check your Wi-Fi connection before joining. Familiarize yourself with features you may need to use such as mute, unmute, stop, start video, and screen share. Mute your mic when not talking. Use the raise hand button if you want to speak. Find a quiet place without interruptions. Be aware that you are on camera. 
Avoid doing things that may cause distraction. Use appropriate equipment for the webinar. If you're using your mobile phone, please use a headset to reduce the noise that they pick in your location. Please avoid using a speaker. When asking a question, always state your name and your institute department first before throwing in your questions. Also, please make your voices clearly heard. If you are tuned into our social media accounts, please state your nickname, department, and your question. Do not spam the chat box. Always be courteous and do not engage in a chat with others while the webinar is ongoing. The organizers reserve their right to disengage anyone who will not follow the guidelines. We are now ready to start our event. Please stand by for the FEU Multifaith Prayer. for gathering us today. Give us the fortitude to conquer life's challenges so we can excel and be upright in everything that we do. Guide us to be united in diversity that we may continue to serve and love one another. Amen. everyone and welcome to Far Stern University Institute of Education Graduate Studies and Transnational Education. We welcome also our Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Maria Teresa Pino, who is Hello. here on board with us, Hello. our faculty and students in the university, our friends here and abroad. Welcome to our graduate online academic lecture series 12. To our returning participants, thank you for joining with us this far. For our newcomers, we welcome you and we assure you that your one hour session with us will be worth the time you spend listening and learning on a Saturday morning. I am Zarla and I will be your moderator for this morning. Here are a few reminders before we continue. We highly appreciate your interaction in this lecture. If you have any questions or insights to share, please type them in our Zoom meeting room chat box. For those who are tuned in with us in our FB page, please also type your questions and share your insights in the comment section. Our speaker will be very glad to address the, your questions during the Q&A time. We would also request you to please accomplish the evaluation form for today's activity until 6 p.m. to be able to receive your certificates. We will be posting the link um, during the Q&A portion. Your feedback is really important to us so we can improve our service to you through our course. Please also visit our website, www.feu.edu.ph, like and share our FB page to get updated of our upcoming activities and programs in the Institute. There are slated conferences and webinars for you, our dear teachers, administrators, practitioners, supporters, and friends. Being awarded a Center of Excellence for Teacher Education, our institute is really committed to providing a quality professional development experience to pre-service and in-service teachers through the dissemination of timely and valuable information to support the academic community in enhancing adeptness to teaching, through various special topics about research, content, and pedagogy. It is for this reason that our graduate online academic lecture series is pursued and sustained. Even with the extent of difficulties we are all facing because of the global school closures, we want to provide you, our dear participants, a venue for a continued academic exchange of 
ongoing ideas and critical issues that impact our practice of the profession. The teaching profession is made more challenging because also of the multi-layered decisions we have to make, for example, about um, instruction. Uh, we accumulate data about our students' performance over time. Still, we are confronted with difficulties on how to make sense of this uh, data to understand the needs of our individual learners and explore mechanisms on how to promote their achievement. Our academic conversations this morning will allow us to delve into this particular topic through the help of an expert and a distinguished member of the faculty in the Institute of Education. So without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker. Dr. Mel Bunuan is a researcher, is a research fellow rather of the graduate studies and transnational education of the Institute of Education of Far Stern University. Before joining FEU, Dr. Mel served as the strategic performance monitor at the Workforce Institute San Jose Evergreen Community College District in San Jose, California. Before migrating to the United States, he taught economics at the University of Santa Tomas for more than 10 years. Dr. Mel holds a master's degree and a doctorate in educational psychology with a focus on quantitative methods from the University of Texas at Austin. His research interest is focused on the application of statistical methods like experimental designs, multi-level models, mediation models, single case experimental designs, and meta-analysis in the analysis of educational, behavioral, and social science data. Dr. Benuwan has also presented several papers at the prestigious Division D of the American Educational Research Association, or AIMA. He is also the co-author of the paper published in the Journal of Teaching and Teacher Education, which was recognized in 2013 with a Distinguished Research Award in Teacher Education by the Association of Teacher Education in the United States. Dr. Bunuan has published in peer-reviewed and high-impact international journals in education, including the Review of Educational Research, the Journal of Experimental Education, International Journal of Social Research Methodology, and Scholar Practitioner Quarterly a Journal for the Scholar Practitioner Leader. So also just a side info, Dr. Romel is currently in the U.S. now. So good evening, Dr. Romel. <laughs> good evening. Uh, thank you for that <laughs> very long introduction, Dr. Zarla. I think I should... Uh, Jenny, uh, can you please check if my screen is already being shared right now? Not yet, sir. Oh, not yet. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, is this a... No, no. Let me see if this... No, this is not the one. Sorry. Uh... Let me hide. Let me open my file. Okay. I thought I, I shared it already, but you know. I sorry. Mm. Okay. Uh, 
and uh, Jenny, do you mind? I I cannot I cannot find the button where I okay I okay so there there you go sorry. <laughs> Dr. Mel, I think we can see the um, list of your uh, the icons. The yeah, yeah yes. we cannot see that. We cannot see the presentation. But while we're waiting for Dr. Mel, maybe Zarla, we have ninety five participants in this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. And I think there were several participants from um, SJCDI. Uh, I can see there, St. Joseph's College of, uh, what's that? Nawala. Of Bagao. Thank you yeah, very Bagao. much for joining us. I think Dr. Romel is from there, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's why. Uh, I don't know why I cannot find my... It's okay. Sometimes so. uh, it's really like that. So while you're looking for that, is it okay, Zarla? We just yeah, say Zarla, hi to people mind. who are here. Oh, there, we can see it. Okay, so, and now I'm trying to. Uh, okay, there, we can see it now. Okay, sorry about the technical glitches. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. let, uh, let me move my. Recording in progress. So okay, I'll try to uh, provide you an overview of what growth curve modeling. So let, let's try to get started by looking at the uh, uh, outline okay, of topics that I will be covering today. So we'll start with you know, defining what growth curve model is, and then we'll get to the approaches in you know, doing the modeling, and then the advantages, what's the advantage of this particular model in terms of you know, estimating your parameters and all that. And then why is growth model a model considered a multi-level model? And we'll also examine how the data structure of you know, longitudinal data uh, looks like when you try to do a growth curve modeling, you, you, you try to fit a growth curve model. And then we will look at different models to, you know, analyze longitudinal data using an, you know, R package, okay, R, R statistical package. Okay. So before I'd like to, before I start, I would like to remind everyone that the goal of this lecture is to provide you an overview of this statistical technique. The, the, this lecture will not be as you know, as extensive as the semester long course that I took in grad school in my, in my, uh, my, my degree, okay. It is one of the uh, uh, advanced statistical research method in grad, graduate school. So I'll just provide you a very basic and overview of what this statistical technique is. So when you talk about growth model, you, you talk about statistical technique that is used to analyze change over time. And when you talk about change, change can be related to, you know, cognitive development, which, you know, basically look at math, reading, science scores of students or individuals, and you're basically examining uh, academic achievement. Or you may be looking at behavioral changes, how, for example, you know, motivation level or level of interest among students develop or change over time or if you are in special education you look at individual you know the the challenges how for example problem behavior develop in school setting or in family like that and another use of growth curve modeling is looking at the you know treatment effects you uh, which is uh, very common in medical field where you know, doctors and medical researchers examine the, for example, the effect of a therapy or the effect of a particular drug in you know, re reducing, for example, anxiety, depression, or any other related health outcomes. So in essence, growth curve modeling uses 
longitudinal data that consists of repeat, repeated measures that you collect within the same individual that you collect you know, repeatedly over a certain period, okay? Now, on the surface, it seems like when you talk about growth curve modeling, it looks very simple, but you know, it gets a little bit complicated or you know, tricky when you start modeling, when you start delving into it. And what really complicates this particular you know, uh, technique is that different statisticians, different methodologies usually call this in different terms. Sometimes they call it like trajectory analysis. They call it longitudinal data analysis. They call it latent curve modeling, latent trajectory analysis, or sometimes they call it hierarchical mixed effects modeling and all that. But if you look at it uh, in terms of what it really, those terms really means, all these terms basically tend to refer to the same underlying you know, analytical technique in analyzing and studying change over time. So now what are the different approaches in studying, you know, in studying, uh, looking at growth rate or studying change over time? There are basically two approaches. One, the first one is the difference score approach, okay? In this kind of, you know, analysis, typically, you have a pre and post test design. So the difference, okay, so what you do with this kind of approach is you, you subtract the pre-test from the post test, and then the difference of those two scores become the basis, become the unit of your analysis. So for example, in, in this kind of analysis, if you want to look at examine change, all you have to do is subtract the previous, okay, from the present to get an estimate of change, okay? So for example, here, you can estimate the difference between this and that, okay? So you, you're basically calculating the difference of the two scores. And then after you've calculated the difference between the two scores, you analyze it and make a, you know, your inference about whether there is a growth, okay? Whether there is a significant increase, here you can see, for example, you analyze, uh, you know, the scores between time one and time two. Then you end up what? Probably say you end up probably uh, uh, concluding that there's a significant increase. And then between two and three, you said probably there's no statistical significant, you know, change in growth. Okay. And then pro uh, let, let's say, for example, you analyze the fourth and fifth, you know, scores. You, you would say what? You would say that there, there is a decrease in scores. So do you see any sort of limitation of using you know, two time points in analyzing growth? Okay? You end up what? You end up okay, using different you know, sets of two adjacent time points, you get different inferences. For example, at this point here, you said, oh, tumaas yung performance niya. Dito, ah, walang pinagbago. Doon sa last, ah, bumagsa, uh, bumaba, okay? So you can see the, the, the limitation of different score analysis in measuring growth. So the question is, if you use this kind of analysis, the question is, what really is going on with this student? Is the trajectory increasing? Is the trajectory constant? or is the trajectory decreasing? And that's precisely the reason why methodologies and statisticians question the, the validity of this analysis. Because if you think about it, when you study change, change is a continuous process and it occurs over time. And when you use only two time points okay, to draw inferences about growth, then that limits. Your, 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 you know, estimate of what growth is. The raw, that, 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 the difference score as a measurement of change according to most, you know, statisticians and methodologies is a misleading estimate of change because the data that you're using are insufficient to sort of capture important details about, you know, students' learning trajectory over time. That is the reason why 
break and Roddenbush, Willett, all these case statisticians and methodologies do not do not really sort of like uh, recommend studying change using two time points. In fact, just like what we saw earlier, Cronbach and Furby noted that this could lead to what fallacious conclusions, particularly because you know this fluctuations in scores may be due to what measurement error. So you can't really you know get an accurate inference when you're using two time points. And for this reason, you know, they, you know, introduced this particular approach, second approach, which is what we call residual change score approach. And this, if you are familiar with your regression, basic math, basically this is, this uses or applies multiple regression model. So if, for example, you, you have a pre and post test design, what you will do is, okay, you regress your post on your pre-test score. So what do I mean by that? Your post-test becomes your dependent variable and your, your pre-test score will be the one predicting your post-test score and whatever. So when you fit the line, when you fit the regression model, whatever that is not explained by your pre-test score will be represented by error, which is basically what you, you may be familiar with what we call unexplained variance in the outcome. And that unexplained variance becomes the unit of analysis. Let me explain that in, in a more, you know, more detailed uh, manner. So here, so here you have the po post-test score, which is your dependent. And now you predict your post based on your pretest. okay? So you run your regression, and based on your you know, analysis, you will obtain what we call a regression line, right? A best fitting line, okay? So I'm not gonna go into the detail of all these, the, the terms here because I have a very limited time. But what I'm, I'd like to emphasize here is your regression line, okay? But I say okay. The, lang maan, mga nuanuta, mga... okay. The, your, your regression line based basically gives you an estimate okay, of how your pre-score affects your outcome score. And whatever is not explained by your independent variable is represented by the error here. So, so ano ang usually sinasabi natin pag may, may regression, uh, regression tayo? Okay? When this error in your regression is large, what do we do? Okay? It means that there is a lot of variance that is not explained by, by your model. So what do we do? We bring in additional you know, predictors to account, <clears throat> to account for that unexplained variance, okay? So here's uh, an illustration of what I, I was talking about earlier. So you fit a regression. So in residual score, you fit a regression using all the you know, data you collected Okay, from different time points, okay, for different time points. So you, you use the entire data and then you fit a line. And so you see here the regression line, okay? The, the regression line, okay? That regression line is sometimes called the best fitting line. But what is important to note here is that we know that the trend, although there are fluctuations, in the scores, okay, this is a score of a given, per, a given student, for example, there are fluctuations in the score, okay? But then by having this line here, it tells, us, it tells us that over time, the score of that individual is increasing. So you notice how, okay, you notice how we, we have summarized this, you know, this data using two important points. So, so when you, you know, run the regression, you get two important pieces of information. One is the intercept, okay? So what does the intercept mean? That's the starting point. That, that's the starting score of that individual. And the slope basically tells you how, okay, the rate of change of okay, in math scores for that particular students. So using, using this regression line here, we see that 
there are some scores that are below, but there are some you know, using this regression line here as shown by the red line, that there are scores that are below it. There are scores that are above it, okay? So, uh, however, this basically tells us now that the scores are changing over time. And this, the, 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 the changes taking place within that particular individual is what we call the intra-individual change the change that is occurring in that particular person. So the, the, the intercept and the slope are now our sort of like, kumbaga siya yung naging summary kung ano ang nangyayari sa, sa estudyante. Okay, so we have basically summarized these six repeated measures, six data points into two pieces of information we call the intercept the, the, the starting score of that particular student and how, you know, the rate of change in the math score of that particular student. Now, this is what we call intra-individual change. But remember, this is only the intra-individual change for a given student, right? So it could be somebody else. It could be my, my intra-individual change. It could be my trajectory. It could be somebody else, okay? But in growth curve, in as much as that we are interested in, you know, examining change over time, in statistics, we rarely examine one individual, rather we examine what? A, you know, a, a, a bunch of or numerous individuals. In fact, when you do, reg, uh, you know, you do growth curve modeling, one requirement is that you need to have a large sample size. So if some suggest that there should be, you should you, you should use about 100 you know individuals per time point. But you know what what I'm trying to say here that using using this concept of intra individual change, then okay, we can expand our analysis by also fitting okay different trajectories, different lines for all the individuals that you have in your study. So if, for example, you have 20 individuals in your study, now you can fit a particular trajectory for that particular student. So if you have 20, what do we have now? We now have a set of starting point, which we call the intercept. And now we have a set of trajectory the rate of change, and you will see here later, okay? Here, now, okay, so, so you now have, we now have a set of intercepts, and now we have a set of trajectories, you know? So if we have a set of individuals, like we have like 20 individuals in your study, what do we usually do? How do we summarize our data? We calculate the mean, right? So we have a set of, you know, initial status, the starting point, we call it initial status in growth curve modeling. So what do we do? We calculate the sample mean, the mean of all the starting point here. In the same manner, we also calculate the slope of all the 20 individuals in your study, okay? So those estimates, okay, so here, Say this is the, the, the sample mean intercept for all the your sample size. And say this is also the measure of growth for your sample size. Then we have you know, what we call the sample mean intercept and the sample mean, um, mean slope, which we call in growth curve modeling as fixed effects, okay? Fixed effects, okay? Uh, anong ibig sabihin ng fixed effects? Ito, ibig sabihin yan, yan na ngayon yung tinatawag natin parang mean ng buong sample. Okay? Yan, yan yung starting point ng buong sample. Ito din ang trajectory. This becomes the trajectory of the entire sample. So, so it's fixed because that represents everyone already. However, ito ang punto ngayon ng, ng growth curve modeling. In growth curve modeling, we are not only interested in, in the mean. We're not only interested in the mean estimate of the intercept. 
we're not only interested in the mean estimate of the slope, we are also interested in variability. Variability. So anong gag gag gagawin natin? We examine the variability of the starting points, the initials, initial status of students in your sample. You examine the variability of their trajectories, the tra trajectories. So if, if we examine the variability, then we, would, we will be able to see that using that sample mean, you will see that some students start very low okay, compared to the mean, right? And some students may start, start very high compared to mean. And some students, what? Are, are somewhat close, okay? Close to the, the sample mean. In the same manner then, ganun din sa slope. Some students may not have the same slope as the sample slope. Some may have here, I'm trying to uh, mention this one. Some students may have a very steep low, uh, trajectory. Some students may have a flatter trajectory. And some students, may, and some students may have a de decreasing trajectory. Now, so when we talk about variability, variability in slope, variability in growth rate or rate of change, that is what we call the inter-individual differences in change. Pagkakaiba-iba ng mga estudyante sa, sa, sa kung saan sila nagsimula at kung paano sila you know, mag, nagbabago. So that's what we mean by inter-individual differences in change. Okay. So basically, yung variability, variability here in the intercept where they start and variability where how they grow is what we call random effects, which basically is inter-individual differences in change between individuals. Okay, between. So, so on the basis of what I've, uh, I've shown you, GCM is really very useful in terms of describing inter-individual differences in intra-individual change over time. What do I mean by this? Meaning that you can examine, you, you know, within student change in growth, okay, in their own growth, okay, but then you can also examine inter-individual differences in growth. Yan ang, sina, yan ang ibig sabihin ng inter-individual differences in intra-individual change over time. I'm not going to spend on, on the other advantages, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll be discussing this later on. So growth curve model uh, is a statistical model that looks at, you know, analyzed nested data, like, okay. And yung growth curve model is a kind of multi-level model. Anong ibig sabihin ng multi-level model? Okay, kasi much of the things that we do in education, in social science, in, in even in clinical studies, in, in medicine, usually is done within a particular setting, group setting, okay? So for example, when you study students, students are nested in classrooms. When you study classrooms, classrooms are nested in schools. Patients, patients are nested within a particular clinic or provider or household within household. So we can say that growth curve model is also a kind of multi-level model because okay, here, students are nested within a classroom. So paano ngayon, bakit multi-level model din ang growth curve model? Kasi you're dealing with nested data also. Why? Because you collect, you collect multiple measures okay, across time, multiple measures, within a par particular individual. That's why longitudinal data is also a multi-level data. So the question is, okay, uh, what is the implication? Ngayon, alam natin longitudinal data and growth curve model. It deals with longitudinal data. What's it, what what basic, basically is the issue when you fit an ordinary least squares? Kung halimbawa, mag ka lang ng regression, yung, yung normal na regression na tinala, linear model na tinatawag natin, okay? So what happens is, okay, 
yung isang assumption ng ordinary least squared, yung regression model na familiar ang lahat, ay dapat, di ba sabi natin sa OLS, dapat yung, yung observations are independent. Okay? That is one assumption, statistical assumption for OLS, ordinary, ordinary least squares. Okay? But then, when you're talking about longitudinal data, the, 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 the observations are no longer what? Are no longer independent because you're collecting this, you know, information from the same individual and those information are correlated and therefore you cannot fit OLS when you're doing growth curve model because the data are correlated. Ang mangyayari, when you fit an OLS, okay, Using longitudinal data, what will happen? It will underestimate yung standard error mo, okay? So remember your simple t-test statistic? You, meet, you get the mean difference. You divide it by the standard error. So ang mangyayari niyan, if you run OLS with longitudinal data, with longitudinal data, sabi ng mga statisticians, etong standard error mo, mababa it will be underestimated. So instead of 0.58, probably it will, it will be uh, underestimated, probably magiging 0.2 siya. So pag 0.2 ito, okay, divide mo yung numerator, anong magiging value nito? It will be much, a lot, a lot larger than that. So what's the implication of that? You are more likely to like reject your HO, null hypothesis, reject your null hypothesis. So, this can lead eventually to what? An inflated type 1 error. And you don't want to do that. You can't, you know, have a type 1 error that is above what is required. So, uh, anong ibig sabi ng type 1 error? If you, you, you have your basic statistics, you reject it. You said, oh, it's statistically, there's statistically significant difference. But in reality, wala pala. So, yun ang error. So, that's the implication of, of, of running OLS. Okay you with longitudinal data so you need really to fit a growth curve model this is the data structure that many of you are familiar with you know every child occupies a particular row and all your variables are on a separate column however this is not the data structure that you need to run a growth curve model you need to reshape your data from wide to long format so eto siya this is a long format data, okay? So ang mangyayari nito, okay, uh, however many me repeated measures you have, kung ilan mang data collection points meron ka sa study mo, every, every person will occupy however, me however many, many repeated measures you have. So if you have da four data collection points that then that person will occupy four rows in your data set. So naging long, long format na siya. Okay, so, so for example, uh, kung meron kang 200, 200 na, na sample and you had their four repeat, repeated measures, you multiply that by five, then your data set can, can be four times than the, the, the wide format, okay? Here, makikita natin ngayon yung weakness ng OLS. Bakit yung OLS, okay, bakit yung ordinary na linear regression hindi pwedeng gamitin para mag-analyze ng, ng longitudinal data? Kasi ito ang problema. Okay. It's not only that OLS cannot account for that you know, dependency or correlation OLS, the issue with the OLS is that the OLS, that ordinary regression that we know, will recognize each row like it's a different individual. So ibig sabihin yan, it will not recognize that these four here, four measures here, belong to the same individual. And so ibig sabihin, every row is treated like it's a different in uh, student or individual. So yun ang reason kaya hindi appropriate ang OLS when you're analyzing a longitudinal data. So these are the data requirements, but I'm not gonna get into that because we're really running out, out of time already. 
Uh, if you have questions, I can share the PowerPoint to anybody interested. But here's, I'd like to sort of like give an example of, you know, this kind of analysis using the data that I, I, I got from the, the, the Center for, uh, National Center for Educational Statistics, uh, which is a department of, okay, which is part of the Department of Education in the United States. So my sample came from this survey, early childhood longitudinal data, and the cohort, cohort were followed from their kindergarten until they reached fifth grade. And actually the, the data in itself, this study uh, has about 18,000 students, which they followed from kinder to fifth grade. But I was only interested, I, I, I was not interested in the entire sample. I was interested in looking at the growth trajectories of students with disabilities. And there's about 2,000, more than 2,000 of them. And there's six waves of data collection, spring K until spring of fifth grade. And the maths and the dependent variable, the outcome that I examine here is the IRT based math score, their math score on a computer adapted testing. And then I look at male, you know, gender distribution and how many have IEP. IEP means like, individualized educational plan and how many do not have individualized educational plan. So before fitting a growth curve model, sabi ko kanina, examine mo muna yung growth trajectories. That's part of the, 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 the requirement. But then it's really difficult to look at trajectories when, when they're bunched into the same sort of quadrant. So methodology suggested to do this, okay? You fit a regression line, for each of these individuals and look at their trajectories. Okay. And so here, sorry, I'm trying, I'm sort of breezing through because it's uh, sa Pilipinas. So many of the trajectories here are, okay, look at the red. They're somewhat smooth and consistent and, and somewhat systematic, okay? Uh, close sila sa regression line nila, okay? But then there are also students whose growth trajectory is somewhat irregular, scattered, or somewhat maybe curvilinear. It's really hard to, to, to look at from this slide alone unless you really have a bigger screen and you can really see the difference, the departures from the regression line. So what do, what's the purpose for doing this? Once you examine the trajectory, then you can sort of like make a, a general impression that, ah, oh, yung growth trajectories pala ng mga estudyante are basically somewhat, what, linear over time, linear over time. So while there are sort of like variations in the fit, okay, because of those, okay, uh, you know, uh, what do you call this, unsystematic, irregular, you know, observations, but generally, what we can say is that the math scores of students with disabilities in the United States are what? Growing in a linear fashion. Okay, fashion. So there, this is the first model that we need to fit. Okay, so basically, Mom, uh, Mom Zarla, how much more time do I need? Because I think um, Mom it's Zarla, 11, Jenny. It's 11.53, sir. Okay, okay. So uh, let me just go through uh, this. Are, so sorry, probably I, I was so ambitious in doing that. I thought, okay. So what basically is okay, what I, what I'm trying to point. That we're gonna miss, but what I'm trying to point out here, uh, my dear audience, is that you know growth curve modeling can be done by okay, I, I, longitudinal data. Analysis can be done, can be yeah, analyzed using growth curve model. And the benefit of growth curve model is that you will be able to look at individual change over time. You, you will be able to estimate it, okay? And then you can have all those research questions, okay? And then you can also look at level two, which is inter-individual differences, okay? So, okay. I am just gonna sum, summarize my findings, okay? Uh, 
So the find is when you run the model, both the, the first model and the second model, okay, sorry, okay, uh, the findings indicate that there's a lot of variability in math scores that is attributed to differences among individuals, okay? That's one finding in my analysis. And the second finding is that there's still a lot of error variance in math scores occurring at the individual level, okay? And there is also a significant variation in where students start and how they grow, okay? So makikita natin yan, uh, I'm trying to hear. See, this is a statistical test of variation. So there's what we call within student variation, how students, okay? So within students means how the scores of students vary within itself. Yan yung error variance. Makita na it still is significant. And then there's also variability in the intercept, which is what we call here the intercept variance. There's also variability in how they grow, which we see here as also statistically significant. So given what we know, given what we know about the, 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 the performance, the growth of students with disabilities, okay, now we can say we can add predictors to probably explain those variability. So probably, what, and when you add predictors in your model, when you add predictors in your model, you will be able to see what students are performing lower than the mean, okay? You, you will be able to see whether, you know, whether male are performing com better compared to male, or you can probably examine whether students with uh, individualized educational plan are, are performing worse than their counterparts, okay? So, or, you can also include, you know, predictors that will explain how, why students are grow steeply, why some students grow flat or decreasing. Okay, so you can expand the model by including those predictors. You can also expand the model by in including time varying uh, predictors, like their level of motivation in math, their level of probably interest in math, some, something like that. All variables that are pertinent to, to your research questions. So in summary, okay, I feel bad that I wasn't able to show you the models. Okay. In, summer, in summary, there are many relevant questions that you can address when you examine those models. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to show you, but you can examine you know, growth trajectories well, by, 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 family, uh, by, by, you know, including different predictors in your model and see how they reduce the variance in math scores. So, so in sum, what I'm saying is, pag meron kang alam mga predictors that is really relevant to your research questions, you can include them, okay, okay, and see how they affect the, the variable, the variance in math scores. So I, that ends my presentation, and I hope that I have given you, even in a rush way, uh, uh, an information that will, you know, pique your interest in doing longitudinal study, or probably that will give you a little bit of information as you are trying, you know, trying to read literature, because you will eventually encounter something like a, a study on longitudinal uh, analysis and all that. So I apologize, okay, I, 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 I missed showing you how to model, you know, you know, a different models in, in this particular statistical technique. And, and thank you everyone. So, and if anybody is, anyone has any questions uh, or interested in collaboration, please email me at this, okay, arbunuan at feu at edu at p, uh, PH. And I also would like to acknowledge Mam Trino uh, for being here. And thank you for, you know, for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Romel, for that very informative presentation. Just wow.
your uh, short and quick presentation gave us an overview and basic understanding of the complexities of a longitudinal data analysis or the growth um, curve models. For some of us who are not really in statistics and qualitative analysis, and at some point um, it can be overwhelming for us, but I'm sure you have reminded us on the importance of really observing and analyzing time series data that um, we have as classroom teachers to predict um, scientifically the growth or academic achievement of our um, students. Mm -hmm. And now maybe um, we still want to open our floor, our, I mean our session for some Q&A. Maybe we can entertain um, one or two questions before um, we end our session this morning. If you have um, questions, but at the moment I haven't seen it. Okay, here's a question, um, Dr. Bunuan. Can it be used to predict future performance of students, say the licensure examination performance or in designing learning intervention? Oh, of course. Okay. Uh, the, the, the thing is, okay, if you are so let, let, let me try to understand the, the, the question, say licensure. Um, so of course you have to, to, uh, to think about, you know, so I'm trying to sort of understand future performance. So basically this is regression, okay? Multi-level regression. So you can also predict performance, but I don't know what, okay? what kind of data you will be using to, to, to you know, predict licensure examination, okay? So uh, the, the one thing that you have to remember is make sure that the observations you're collecting are really related to, you know, what you're trying to predict. So uh, probably I'm not really getting any, uh, I, I'm not probably answering your question, but what I'm saying is, whatever observations you have collected from different time points. So uh, make sure that the outcomes that you have collected are also somewhat similar to that, okay? To the, the, the you know, the for probably you're saying about passing the licensure examination. So probably you, you have to do a literature review looking at what are the factors that, you know, that influence passing the licensure examination. If there are information that you can gather there, then probably that would also inform your modeling, okay? Because your model basically is, you know, can be used also to predict, you know, outcomes that you, 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 you are trying to you sort of like look at. But what I'm saying is that yung outcomes na measure mo somewhat related to doon sa outcomes na you're trying to predict. Thank you for that, Dr. Romel. Um, so far, there are no questions posted in our um, FB live. And um, maybe some insight from Aiden. The data will be the grades of students, professional, general education, and grades in major subjects. Mm -hmm. The data will be grades of students and professional. So, so I mean, I cannot really advise you unless I know what your research question is. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, it's really difficult to, I don't want to say with certainty, I don't want to advise you with certainty if I don't really know it specifically the, your research question, what, what you're trying to sort of like look at. Yes, I think see Dr. Uh, Harold. Dean Harold, Dean Harold, our academic dean. Of I got very interested. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramel. Uh, I got very interested, although my area of research is in uh, more inclined to qualitative case study. Um, I'm very interested in the use of the growth uh, change model. You're saying, and according to literature, that the lesser time point, it, the more possibility that the conclusions or the inferences will be fallacious. So what's the minimum time points that you can recommend to make it yeah. more, uh, I don't want to say reliable result. But yeah, 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 you're right, Dean. Actually, I skipped that part. There's the data requirement 
doing uh, growth curve modeling, you need to have at least three time points, okay? Three repeated measures. However, statisticians and methodology suggest that if you can have more, then your estimates will be much more accurate and reliable. So mas magiging valid yung estimates mo. So if you have more time points okay, uh, in your study, then the better because it provides you a better estimate of your growth parameters, a better estimate of your initial intercept, and a better estimate of your, you know, that slope, the rate of change, and, and better, uh, yeah. So that's so time that. points can be either months or years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's consistent time points. Yes. It could be categorical where you just classify it one, two, three, four of equal distance. It could be age. It could be one year old, three years old, and they may not have the same interval. So it could be three months. It could be seven months, second time point, then 10 months, third time point. So now your time becomes sort of like a continuous uh, variable compared to just like the one, two, three, four, five. Okay, something like yeah. Okay, thank you. For that, Sarah Mel, um, I remember our earlier conversations where I, I was um, sharing to you about what I did in my um, master's thesis. So I did an ABA design, and you were telling me that um, growth curve models can be a statistical. Um, analysis that I could have used in my paper. And with the time interval, if I can remember it right, because that was 2012, I think I did a two year, uh, two weeks, I mean, uh, two week interval in between um, gathering data for my baseline and then treatment, going back to baseline and um, treatment again. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I, I forgot to mention to you while we were conversing that single subject experimental design is also a longitudinal design mm -hmm. because you're gathering multiple measures within the same individual. So basically you can run, okay? It's just a different like kind of technique. So the, the, the thing with single subject design is you start with a baseline where there's mm -hmm. no treatment, right? And then you, you apply the intervention. And then what happens? Look at what happened to the outcome. Did it? So if, for example, you're doing, you're doing motivation, did it increase motivation? Or if you are doing examining outcomes related to depression or anxiety, did it go down? So you look at the baseline, okay? Trend, the trend during the baseline where there was no inter intervention. And then after you've, you've administered the treatment, look at what happened af what happens after. So you have that another, another phase, they call it. So A, B. So A mm -hmm. is where there's no intervention. B is where you have intervention. intervention. And then, yeah, so that, that it is essentially also a longitudinal design. Okay? Thank you, Dr. Mel. I think the presentation is really interesting and we still have questions coming. Another question that um, we want to um, address this morning is, in relation to student achievement in public secondary schools, what growth curve model example po ang appropriate to use in a school year as a time frame? Uh, in a school year? Well, you have to look at how you are collecting those data. So if you are administering, for example, let's say you're more interested in looking at the midterms, final exams. So, so first year, midterm, final exam. So those, those could be time points. Second year, midterm, final exam. So I mean, the, 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 the advantage of using growth curve model is you can really adapt any kind of, any measure of time. Time can be, either a continuous or categorical variable. It will not affect your, your estimation. Okay, so, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mel. And another question is, in a longitudinal study, do we consider large numbers of respondents or do we have an acceptable population? 
especially okay. um, the context that we have now. Yeah, yeah. So you know, there, there, there is always an issue of what we call adequate sample size in statistics. When do we say that sample size is adequate? But methodologies based on analytical and simulation studies, they recommend at least 100 individuals, okay, per time point. And when you are collecting data, you need to have at least three measurements, okay, measurements, okay. So if it's a bean, then you, in, you have to have at least 100 students or individuals per data collection point. At dapat, pag nag-collect ka, tatlong measurement bawat estudyante. But at least, you have at least three uh, time points. Otherwise, it becomes just a pre and post, di ba? Kung dalawa lang, pre and post lang. Uh, I mean, there's a disadvantage of that already, I, as I already uh, shown, have shown you. Okay. So there's another question. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ramil. There's another question. Are we focusing on the meaningfulness of the variations in each time point to support mean in time points in terms of growth curve models? Uh, so I, I, I don't really know what you mean by meaningfulness, but the, the purpose, this, I, didn't, I wasn't able to discuss it in my presentation. The purpose of fitting Growth curve models is you want to measure how much variation is taking place among individuals. So my, my, my model, Yan, how much variation is taking place in terms of their growth. So yun ang measure mo. Bakit magkakaiba? So parang ganito yung tanong eh. Bakit magkakaiba ang performance nila at certain time point? Baka siguro may mga factors probably like for for example the one that i, I just looked at yung inanalyze ko so compare ko yung mga estudyante na merong individual individual educational plan and those that do not have educational plan individual di ba alam niyo yung individualized educational plan para yung plano yan para nila ma-address yung disability challenges ng mga estudyante na to so ibig sa and nakita ko sa findings ko that most students who have individualized educational plans are the ones starting low, are the ones na mababa ang score. So that could be one, one predictor that could explain why there is, I don't know if you mean meaningfulness, I, uh, why merong variation, merong pagkakaiba-iba in terms of where they start in your, you know, in that, you know, time frame that you, you're, you know, uh, investigating, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Romel. Uh, Dr. Romel, sorry, I'm picking up on your answer doon sa um, population for the longitudinal study. Um, correct me if I am wrong, Dr. Romel, but I'm going back to the, that single subject design. I guess if your design is a single subject, it doesn't yeah. have to be 100 in population. No, right? no, 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 uh -huh. yeah. We are no. doing single subject design um, because we the assumption of the researcher is napaka konte ng sample na pwede niyang makuha but konte dahil pare parehas dapat yung um, demographics or attributes nila. Um, I just want to share, for example, my master's thesis. I did a single subject design. I only have seven hmm. as my participants uh, for for that study. Pero pare-pareha sila na um, ang severity ng loss of sight nila is total loss of sight. Even yung cause of blindness, which is um, retinopathy, um, yung naipanganak sila na prematurity of re re retinopathy, naipanganak sila na premature, kaya naging blind sila. Even they have the same age. So it's, uh, and they should be in a special school. So with that kind of inclusion criteria, it would be very difficult to really look for a sample. And, and, what and comments, so that warrants a single subject design. And I, I'd like to add to that, uh, Dr. Zarla, when you're doing single case experimental design, you are not, the sample is not based on how many 
how many individuals you're looking at because mm -hmm. few designs to n minus one designs sabi nga nila or and mm -hmm. I, I can't remember any more ang importante is you have multiple repeated measures and those are the ones mm -hmm. that are more important when you're doing ex, uh, single experimental design I, I know a little bit of say single experimental design because I've worked with my my advisor who did publish tons of you know work on single experimental design okay so hindi importante yung kung ilan ang individuals mm -hmm. importante kung ilang observations repeated measures and that in itself will sort of also you know, uh, uh, what you call render the validity of, of that particular technique. Thank yes. you for that, uh, Dr. Romel. So I think um, this will be the last question. If there is a significant variation in the time points, then there is a factor contributing to mm -hmm. it, like an ANOVA repeated measures or etc. Okay. So, sorry, I breezed through it. Diba? Si, sabi ko kanina, what did we find out? about the models that we ran, but hindi ko naman ay pakita sa inyo models na niran ko, di ba? So, ang findings ko sa model, there were significant variation in, okay, in level one, and then yung error, I ibig sabihin, marami pa rin error, and then there's also significant variation in intercept, where they start, and there's also significant variation in what? In the slope, where the rate of change. So, ano ngayon, as a researcher, anong dapat mong gawin mo? You have to think about predictors that will explain those and will account for those unexplained variants. Kasi yung variants na yan, parang error yan eh. So paano mo ngayon i-account yung error? You have to add predictors to explain that variation. Y y yun ang ano, okay? Thank Zarna, you. Maybe we can acknowledge those who ask questions. Like the last question was asked by Avelino Ignacio Jr. I think he's our first year EDD student at, uh, wow. at the Institute. Uh, thank you. His nickname is Billy. So, B Billy, thank you for asking. And yeah, a question you. from FB, I think Heidenberg, I think this is uh, Dr. Den Den, one of our faculty members in the Institute. Thank you for asking. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge also Dale, who asked a, a, another question from CNU. Maybe next time you tell us uh, your university so that we can acknowledge you properly. Uh, Adrian Ginto. Who else? Okay. So, yeah, thank you for asking questions, uh, especially to our students and colleagues. So uh, I just... Last, last, last kulana message to everyone. Okay, I'd like to emphasize that when you're learning statistics, especially when you're in education, dapat ang pagtuturo at pag pag pag-aaral ng statistics, lalo na sa education, behavioral sciences, ay hindi sa computational aspect. So when I teach statistics for you know, pag ako magtuturo ng statistics sa research methods. I'll not emphasize the computational aspect of it. I will emphasize this is the equation and what does it mean. Kaya nga nagkakaroon tayo ng mga anxiety among nagkakaroon ng anxiety among students not to take, you know, uh, statistics or research methods class is because there is so much emphasis on computational. That's not that's not necessary anymore. What is important is you understand what this equation is telling you, and then you are able to interpret it. And you are able to run it using statistical programming languages. Interpretation at understand, conceptual understanding, ang importante. Hindi yung magde-derive ka. Derive standard deviation. You know, no, that's not, hindi na yan. Hindi na yan importante lalo sa education. We're not part of the theoretical statistics. Statistics na yan sa mga hardcore math. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Romel, for that um, informative lecture. And also, thank you for your final words. We will not leave this room with uh, heavy hearts dahil 
baka some of us will be frustrated dahil isipin din naman namin gaano maintindihan ang growth curve models because um, we can do yung bang math ng um, statistical analysis. Thank you for that. Um, thank you also to our participants for staying with us in our goals 12. Our Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Trina. Good afternoon, Ma'am Trina. Um, Trina. Hi, Sarla. Hi, Sarla. Uh, good afternoon, um, our Dean in the Institute of Education. And we have participants from St. Joseph College of Bagao Incorporated and Jan Wesley College of Tugegarao. These are both in Cagayan Valley. Um, participants sure. from the from University of Antique, Tario Lim Memorial Campus, Tibiao, Antique. And um, some friends here and um, listeners abroad. And we hope to see you in our goals 13 for yet another engaging and informative sessions. Um, please do not forget to send us your feedback about today's event via the evaluation link posted in our chat box now. And after you record in your names and email addresses in the evaluation form, your e-certificates will be sent. Again, please visit our web, web page, www.feu.edu.ph and like our FB page to get updated of our upcoming activities. Again, this is Zarla, and once again, good afternoon. Let us stay connected. Thank you Thank very you. much, everyone.